chapter 10, polarity. Uh, this is an important thing for people to understand, and we're starting to move into this sort of murky, um, well, it's not murky, metaphysical waters that when properly understood confront a lot of people with things that they cannot deal with. Um, so let's, let's deal with it. <laughs> everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pairs of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. The Kabbalion. The great fourth hermetic principle, the principle of polarity, embodies the truth that all manifested things have two sides, two aspects, two poles, a pair of opposites, with manifold degrees between the two extremes. The old paradoxes, which have ever perplexed the mind of men, are explained by an understanding of this principle. Explained but not resolved. Uh, man has always recognized something akin to this principle and has endeavored to express it by such sayings, maxims, and aphorisms as everything is and isn't. Um, at the same time, all truths are but half-truths. Every truth is half-false. There are two sides to every story. There's a reverse side to every shield. All of these things are true and false, and it is both true and false to say that they are true and false. Um, the hermetic teachings are to the effect that the difference between things seemingly diametrically opposed to each other is merely a matter of degree. It teaches that the pairs of opposites may be reconciled, and that thesis and antithesis are identical in nature, but different in degree, and that the universal reconciliation of opposites is affected by a recognition of the principle of polarity. The teachers claim that illustrations of this principle may be had on every hand, and from an examination into the real nature of anything. They begin by showing that spirit and matter are but the two poles of the same thing, the intermediate planes uh, being merely degrees of vibration. They show the all and the many are the same, the difference being merely a matter of degree of manifestation. Thus, the law and the laws are two opposite poles of one thing. Likewise, principle and principles, infinite mind and finite minds. Then, passing on to the physical plane, they illustrate the principle by showing that heat and cold are identical in nature, the differences being merely a matter of degrees. The thermometer shows many degrees of temperature, the lowest pole being called cold and the highest heat. Between these two poles are many degrees of heat or cold. Call them either and you are equally, equally correct. The higher of two degrees is warmer, while the lower is colder. There's no absolute standard. All is a matter of degree. There is no place on the thermometer where heat ceases and cold begins. It is all a matter of higher or lower vibrations. The very term high and low, which we are compelled to use, are but poles of the same thing. The terms are relative. So with east and west, travel around the world in an eastward direction, and you reach a point which is called west at your starting point, and you return from that western point. Travel far enough north, and you will find yourself traveling south, or vice versa but you will end up right back where you were. Light and darkness are poles of the same thing, with many degrees between them. The musical scale is the same. Starting with C, you move upward until you reach another C, and so on. The differences between the two ends of the scale being the same. Uh, pitch, with many degrees between the two extremes. The scale of color is the same. Higher and lower vibrations being the only difference between high violet and low red. Large and small are relative, so are noise and quiet. Hard and soft follow the rule. Likewise, sharp and dull. Positive and negative are two poles of the same thing, with countless degrees between them. Good and bad are not absolute. We call one end of the scale good and the other bad, or one end good and the other evil, according to the use of the terms. A thing is less good than the thing higher in the scale, but that less good thing in turn is more good than the thing next below it, and so on the more or less being regulated by the position on the scale. And this gets further complicated if you accept the premise that uh, good and evil literally create each other um, and are totally uh, interdependent. Um, and this is where people get into a lot of trouble. And this is one of the reasons for the secrecy of the hermetic tradition. Um, and, I mean, I even hesitate to talk about it. Um, and, you know, it's something I, I realized on my own, I started to think this, that, you know, these opposites actually generate each other. It's not just that you have to know good in order to recognize evil. Uh, a lot of people say that, you know, that if you, 
if you you wouldn't know pleasure if you didn't know what pain was i think that's complete nonsense uh but i think they wouldn't exist without each other even more fundamentally and and when i discovered the writings about this and all these different mystics the buddha spoke about it he said that if you're if you're going to escape karma because of this equal and opposite reaction that happens you know, if you do good, evil comes from it. If you do evil, good comes from it. The only way to escape from this cycle of samsara, of karma, is to sit and breathe and total neutrality because opposites will arise from whatever action you partake in. And so there's, you know, it's, it, it, this can also cause you an existential crisis to, to realize this. And then you feel like, well, then what's the point in anything? Um, we are all uh, but actors on a stage uh, you know, the old Shakespearean thing is, is you just have to choose a role uh, that aligns with your highest purpose. Um, and, you know, another another great example of this is um, what was it? the mystic St. John of the Cross, I think. Um, he said, it, talking about this, writing about it, he said, so should we sin that grace may come? God forbid, you know. Um, but isn't that what God himself did when he created Satan with the germ of his fall in him, <laughs> you know? So, uh, when I, when I said we get into murky water here, this is, this is where mysticism can get dangerous, uh, understanding the really, truly fundamental dynamics of the universe. And this plane, this causal plane, uh, can really get you into some trouble, uh, and again, this is why these are really closely guarded. See, it's also the, what I'm talking about here is why the initiates of the right-hand path, uh, those magicians that serve the collective interest uh, above their own self-interest, as opposed to the black hats or the left-hand path that only serve their own interests, uh, this is why the white hats do not hate or look down on the black hats, because they understand that they are actually saviors in a sense, because it is their complete and total sacrifice of their eternal being uh, through their evil that is generating the most pure um, innocence and beauty and perfection in the universe. So it's this crazy, you know, it's one of the secrets behind the yin yang symbol with the, you know, little bit of white in the black and a little bit of black in the white. Um, it's really a crazy thing. Uh, so, you know, you just have to choose choose your role. It's like Dungeons and Dragons in hell <laughs> sometimes. Um, and so it is on the mental plane. Love and hate are generally regarded as being things diametrically opposed to each other. Um, entirely different, unreconcilable. But we apply the principle of polarity. We find that there is no such thing as absolute love or absolute hate as distinguished from each other. In fact... When um, a murder scene is investigated, if how extreme and passionate the violence is, uh, if it's really, really bad, that is an indication that it was someone close to the person that was murdered. And so that is, you know, extremes meet. Um, this is another thing that's difficult for us to wrap our heads around. But, you know, forensics tells us, you know, in criminal psychology that this is the case. In fact, you don't really even have that absolute hate without love in the mix to some extent. The two are merely terms applied to two poles of the same thing. Beginning at any point of the scale, we find more love or less hate as we ascend the scale and more hate or less love as we descend. This being true no matter from what point high or low we may start. There are degrees of love and hate, and there is a middle point where like and dislike become so faint that it is difficult to distinguish between them. Courage and fear come under the same rule. The pairs of opposites exist everywhere. Where you find one thing, you find its opposite, the two poles. And it is this fact that enables the hermeticist to transmute one mental state into another along the lines of polarization. And see, it's because everything contains this contradiction, this kind of realization that can be totally paralyzing and neutralizing and, you know, give you this existential crisis that I was mentioning. Um, 
also give you hope. Uh, because when you realize that it's one energy that can be transmuted into its opposite, um, then, you know, it's, it has the same potential to create positivity and to empower you than it does to neutralize and, you know, give you this existential crisis of what's the point, right? It's, it's your role. It's how you choose to relate to this knowledge um, that determines what you're going to do with it. So, things of the same class may be changed, that is, they may have their polarity changed, thus love never becomes east or west, or red or violet, but it may and often does turn into hate, and likewise hate may be transformed into love by changing its polarity. Courage may be transmuted into fear and the reverse, hard things may be rendered soft, Dull things become sharp, hot things become cold, and so on. The transmutation always being between things of the same kind of different degree. Take the case of a fearful man. By raising his mental vibrations along the line of fear courage, he can be filled with the highest degree of courage and fearlessness. And likewise, the slothful man may change himself into an active energetic individual simply by polarizing along the lines of the desired quality. The student who is familiar with the processes by which the various schools of mental science, etc., produce changes in the mental states of those following their teachings may not readily understand the principle underlying many of these changes. When, however, the principle of polarity is once grasped and it is seen that the mental changes are occasioned by the change of polarity, a sliding along the same scale, the matter is more readily understood. The change is not in the nature of a transmutation of one thing into another thing entirely different, but is merely a change of degree in the same things, a vastly important difference. For instance, borrowing an analogy from the physical plane, it is impossible to change heat into sharpness, loudness, highness, etc., but heat may readily be transmuted into cold simply by lowering the vibrations. In the same way, hate and love are mutually transmutable, so are fear and courage. But fear cannot be transformed into love, nor can courage be transmuted into hate. The mental states belong to innumerable classes, each class of which has its opposite poles, along with transmutation, along which transmutation is possible. The student will readily recognize that in the mental states, as well as the phenomena of the physical plane, the two poles may be classified as positive and negative, respectively. Thus, love is positive to hate, courage to fear, activity to non-activity, etc., etc. And it will also be noticed that even in those unfamiliar with the principle of vibration, the positive pole seems to be of a higher degree than the negative and readily dominates it. The tendency of nature is in the direction of the dominant activity of the positive pole. And this is a great secret of great, tremendous power. Um... Uh, I, I just got distracted when I read the, the, the chat. Let me, let me look back and see what I was just thinking. Cause it's like, this is the most important thing here and it's gone. Um, oh, the tendency of nature is in the direction of the dominant activity of the positive pole. And this is why it is that you don't have to believe in a moralistic loving creator God in order to understand how it is that I, for example, you know, get weird support from the universe because I have aligned myself with a general positive direction that, you know what I mean? I've aligned my individual will with the greater will of the collective, which helps, but it's also the positive impulse of creation um, that it's, it's, it's movement has, you know, thrust and it has uh, momentum, whereas the entropy um, that is chaos and, and degradation and negativity does not have this forward motion that is built into it structurally. It doesn't have the, how did he put it? The, um, the positive, the dominant activity of the positive pole. Uh, you know, it is basic fundamental physics even that if you, uh, constrain your will, uh, to be in, con to be congruent with the, positive um that you are more powerful it's, it's it's science it's not woo you know um so that's dope <laughs> in addition to the changing of the poles of one's own mental states by the operation of the art of polarization the phenomena of mental influence in its manifold phases 
shows us that the principle may be extended so as to embrace the phenomena of the influence of one's mind of one mind over that of another of which so much has been written and taught of late years uh, when it is understood that mental induction is possible that it is that mental state may be produced by induction from others then we can readily see how a certain rate of vibration or polarization of a certain mental state may be communicated to one person and his polarity in that class of mental states has changed it is along this principle that the results of many of the mental treatments are obtained for instance a person is blue melancholy and full of fear a mental scientist would that be a neuroscientist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Bringing his own mind up to the desired vibration by his trained will and thus obtaining the desired polarization in his own case then produces a similar mental state in the other by induction. The result being that the vibrations are raised and the person polarizes toward the positive end of the scale instead toward the negative and his fear and other negative emotions are transmuted to courage and similar positive mental states. A little study will show you that these mental changes are nearly all along the line of polarization, the change being one of degree rather than of kind. A knowledge of the existence of this great hermetic principle will enable the student to better understand his own mental states and those of other people. He will see that these states are all matters of degree, and seeing thus, he will be able to raise or lower the vibration at will to change his mental poles and thus be master of his mental states instead of being their servant and slave. And by his knowledge, he will be able to aid his fellows intelligently and by the appropriate methods change the polarity when the same is desirable. We advise all students to familiarize themselves with this principle of polarity, for a correct understanding of the same will throw light on many difficult subjects. Very true, very important in these times, uh, you know, and, and, and a little bit of explanation about how he's talking about, it sounded like when someone's sitting with a therapist or a psychologist or maybe even a guru um, or a spiritual teacher, I shouldn't use the word guru because it's not a good thing <laughs> generally, um, you know, what we perceive is that there's language being exchanged and things are being said to this individual and that's part of it, um, but fundamentally that's not real. And um, even words are vibration, which was the previous chapter, right? So um, it really, what is going on is that there are cycles in training when one person is lifting another person up. Uh, there's a really ex important experiment that was done in the 1990s in Washington, DC um, uh, with meditators. And so the experiment was to see if I can't remember how many of them there were, there were a lot of them maybe 20,000 or, or it could have been less. I haven't read the study in a long time, but you know, a bunch of people meditating, people with lots of experience. And their goal was to see if they could drop the crime rate in Washington, DC, which is where I lived at the time. Um, it was the murder capital of the world, not the country, but the world um, by 20%. And the chief of police went on record at a uh, press conference saying the only thing that is going to lower the crime rate in Washington, D.C. in June is two feet of snow. And so these meditators came and they did their thing and the crime rate dropped by 20 percent. Um, and the, the, the chief of police actually had a press press conference and said, I, I am just completely dumbstruck. And, you know, we can't discount the possibility that it was just an extraordinary coincidence. Uh, but it's quite remarkable, those results. Um, and <clears throat> again, you know, I always cite uh, the law of entrainment um, as a way for us to understand, uh, you know, we know that everything is connected. Uh, but at this point, thanks to, you know, science, um, we, we know that all of these cycles, right, this cycling pulses, right, they're everywhere all sorts of different types um and when any of them raise basically the lower ones are compelled to entrain with the higher and so you know we have good physical basis um to believe to accept that by elevating our own consciousness we can change the minds of people on the other side of the planet um and really and literally on the other side of the universe. And we know also that these changes in uh, energetic states, basically, 
uh, happen instantaneously regardless of distance because of the theory of entanglement. And so we have a very, 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 very strong basis of understanding. Also, if we consider that there is some greater intelligence um, that is cycling higher than all of us, and it is continuing to cycle higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, it's going to pull the entire net of consciousness up. And you may be saying, Illuminostic, uh, aren't you contradicting yourself? Um, <laughs> Because you said that, you know, things create their opposite. Well, you have to remember that all of this stuff is relative. So we have, say, the sphere of consciousness, and then we have something pulling it higher and higher and higher. So, sure, there's this relative, um, uh, you, know, you know, there's there's this space of potential, possible potential, you could say. And so as it goes higher and higher and higher, the lowest manifestation possible is always going higher and higher and higher because there's something pulling it. You understand what I'm saying? And because things are just degrees, uh, you know, the the relative evil, we can sort of escape it by ascending higher and higher and higher and higher. Relative to the greatest good, you know, once you are way up on the scale, you could create its opposite and it still wouldn't be that bad. You know, um, this is why, how you can know this stuff and, and not feel like it's all pointless because uh, it's not. Um, it's, you know, another, another element of this, though, is that people discover this and realize that they can kind of abuse this knowledge uh, and they're still actually serving a necessary function in the universe. But that's a topic for another, another day. Um, so let's see. I smoked DMT half an hour before tuning in, and that is the only reason I happened to come here when I did. I wouldn't have taken the same course of action if I hadn't smoked and had there just to finish a project I've been working on. Yeah, well, you know, things happen um, in um, strange. Is this shirt that I'm wearing? I had literally just put, this is a, like a Mayan or Aztec sundial. Basically the same. Um, and I had just edited one into a video and I'd never thought about what was on this shirt before. I, I, I didn't even, I just thought it was a face. It, it never occurred to me. I, I, don't, I guess I probably didn't look at it that closely or something, but, you know, I, that had never consciously occurred to me. And I just went to the closet to pull the shirt out and put it on. And I realized I'm looking at exactly the image that I had just edited into this video a few minutes before I took a shower and changed my, my shirt. So um, that's the way it goes. And I think... You know, beauty is uh, the human mind. What we think of as beauty is symmetry, uh, particularly in human faces, but in general. And so as you elevate your consciousness, you perceive external and internal symmetry. That's what we call synchronicity. And it becomes more and more obvious as you cycle higher and higher, because the higher your consciousness is, the more symmetry there is. You know, when you're talking about perceptions of beauty and, and whatnot, that's what it is on a, you know, pragmatic level. Um, so if you guys have any other questions or comments, I'm actually probably going to cut this. I'm going to download it and edit it um, because I had no, I didn't, I, it's been a long time since I've read this book. And honestly, I think I've only ever flipped through it. Because it wasn't important for me to read every word. It was just that I was, the, all this stuff had come to me through my own meditations and psychedelic experiences and just, I'm just always thinking about this stuff. Uh, so for me, the important thing was the, the way that I found the book. And when I realized what was in it, it was just like a confirmation that, you know, there, this is, there are people that know this stuff and have been around for a while. Um, so I, I didn't really realize how important that last bit from the principle of polarity was going to be. Um, I'm almost tempted to just read it again because, you know, we, we really need to absorb this stuff. Uh, it seems like we're facing some really formidable, um, well, seems like we're definitely facing the most formidable uh, circumstances that we ever have. But you have, guys have to remember that all this hermetic stuff is true and that opposites do create each other. And uh, everything contains this contradiction, including a moment in time. So if we're looking at the time in human history that has the most liberating potential, the greatest uh, seeds of enlightenment, um, you know, soaking wet and ready to sprout, uh, we're also going to be facing our extinction at that moment. This is the structure of the universe. Um, 
And the reason that people can be confident that they're that the good usually will triumph, it's not a guarantee, I don't think. I, I um, but just about really. Uh, you know, this positive positive pull has the greater power because it's action, it's activity, you know, it's 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 movement. Uh, and the opposing force is really just entropy um, and, and chaos. And so it's soft and yielding and malleable. And it can easily, I mean, another great analogy is if you uh, go into a dark room or, or go into a lit room with your hands cupped and then you open them, the darkness is gone. But if you go into um, a dark dark room with a handful of light and open it, the room becomes light. Um, so, you know, these, and it's one thing doing one thing. So, you know, if you do this and you're like, okay, well, that's a great metaphor. It's not just a metaphor. This is an expression of the fundamental reality of the universe that we exist in. What can one do to help with sliding a personality trait along the spectrum to its opposite? Well, it depends on which um, which personality trait you mean. Uh, but um, there are a number of good exercises uh, for this. Um, one is uh, meeting every idea with its contradiction. Um, so that if you have a belief uh, you just try to assume the opposing position and, um, and then after you have really, really thought it out from, you know, the opposing point of view, uh, you kind of see what you're left with. Um, another thing that you can do, um, is a practice of mindfulness, mindfulness, uh, with a, with the intention of analysis Right. I mean, you have to develop some proclivity at this. You have to at least have a basic understanding of how to do it. But in my experience, most people are smart enough to do basic psychoanalysis on themselves. Um, so you just have to get into the, the, the habit and the process of analyzing what you're doing, paying attention. And when you notice something that, that you, you know have for their basis, for their cause, uh, some kind of aberrative experience some kind of trauma um you consider the source and oftentimes just by considering the source uh this 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 shit loses its, its power over you um the analogy uh of of fairy tales children's fairy tales where you know a witch will cast a spell and the children will realize that there's a spell and it breaks the spell um it seems like an oversimplification, but it's it's really the, the entire basis of um, psychoanalysis, and it works. Um, you know, and then there's also uh, conscious conditioning. Um, just as we are trying to decondition all of our cultural influences that do not serve us, uh, we can do the opposite, and you can condition yourself in positive ways. And for that, you need to find your motivation. Um, what is it that you hope to gain? What does it mean to you? Why does it mean so much to you? What is in your way? You know, and so uh, you're able to isolate uh, the uh, that which does not serve you and uh, condition yourself um, in the opposite way. I mean, a really corny, basic, generic, cliche example of this is from Saturday Night Live back in like the 70s, I think they had like this this guy that would like look in the mirror and say, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like you, you know? I mean, it really is true that just repetitive thoughts, uh, especially, and you know this, in a psychedelic state, when you have enhanced your neuroplasticity uh, and you have all sorts of neurogenesis going on and you have access to uh, more of your brain than normal, you know, you have electric electrical activity in parts of the brain that aren't normally even being used, uh, you have access to all of these memories and, you know, the subconscious is available to the conscious mind. 
Um, you know, particularly in these states, uh, you know, I recommend moderate doses, not too low, not too high. You don't want to be overwhelmed and confused, uh, but you need to take enough that, you know, you have a good connection. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 the hemi-sync, the, the different parts of your mind and being are really easily, you know, able to connect and communicate. Uh, and you have sufficient neuroplasticity um, to make changes you know, that kind of mental conditioning and pranayama, 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 pranayama for mind and body alike. There is no purgative like pranayama. Um, the thing is, uh, and it's important to remember that no, um, no set of talents and virtues or any set of talents and virtues is totally useless in the absence of willpower and discipline. And so when it comes to something like pranayama, I'm guilty of this. I hate to admit it, but I could do better. Uh, pranayama really allows you to um, really, really, really rapidly, uh, rewire these neural circuits. Um, and you know, in, in a way that is lasting, uh, you guys, probably some of you have heard my smoking story, how I did that. It took two hours, hundred micrograms of LSD and some pranayama. Um, and I didn't even remember that I was a smoker the next day, the same day or the next, next day. Yeah. The next day I found my tobacco pouch in the pockets of my pants. And I was like, Oh yeah, I used to smoke. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's really, you know, if I was going to say like, you, as long as you know what your issue is that you're trying to correct, um, pranayama with a moderate dose of LSD or psilocybin, uh, for just a couple of hours can do miraculous things in terms of repatterning so anything else guys otherwise thank you so much for spending this time with me please do support us on patreon we're demonetized i get nothing for this uh, unless you guys support us uh, there are options in the description and in the chat and we have a store that has some awesome shirts and promotion going on this month um, so please do hit the like button and support us and i will see you guys tomorrow i'm going to do um the book of the law commentary with Crowley's commentary as well uh, because last time I did it in the jungle uh, we had really bad internet and the the, the, the quality of those videos is terrible uh, and, and it's really important stuff so uh, and a lot of people have told me that it's like their favorite content that I've made and I and know it's you know a lot of people can't even watch it because this audio is terrible and stuff so we're going to remedy that tomorrow and uh, I will see you guys then